If you have or are looking at getting one of the Lumix S series cameras and you shoot people, you'd probably be interested in a portrait length lens. Now, the most common portrait focal length is 85 millimeters and Panasonic has brought out its own or is about to bring one out. Oops, is about to bring one out in your neck of the woods. And it's both compact and inexpensive. The question is, is it of the right value for you? We're gonna try and look at that. Now I know, I know there's two things you have to know about this lens, is what's the shallow depth of field if this is only an f1.8 lens? And is that a terribly large compromise when you could have something that's wider open than that? And also what's the autofocus like continuously in video? Well, I assure you there's a lot more to a lens than just those two things, but I promise to cover those two things with some real world tests. And in addition to that, look at things like selective focus, sun stars, vignetting, chromatic aberrations, focal balls, and all that, right after this. I first shot with a very, very early pre-production version of this back in August uh, 2020 when I did a behind the scenes video of Johan Sorensen testing out the S5 camera before it was available. Back then, the 85 millimeter lens was running firmware version 0.2 and there were some quirks to be sure with the aperture settings and whatnot, but it was a pre-production unit and what I saw was a shockingly small 85 millimeter lens that had great optics. I only used it personally for about 60 seconds, although here's some images that Johan took with it. From the images that I did take, I could see that the optics were something that I would be comfortable using myself, and the focus tracking actually was better than I expected. So here we are, six months later, and this lens is coming to market. Panasonic Canada has lent me this lens, but they haven't seen my review in advance. Um, these are my tests, my opinions. Um, this lens is also pre-production, um, but is now running uh, a firmware version 1.0. So you can expect that the results that I get are results that you would get uh, similar to anyways, or maybe even slightly better uh, with a production lens and perhaps even newer firmware. This is a small lens relative to full frame lenses that I'm used to. Um, I've shot Canon for six years and then I moved to Panasonic uh, and I've been shooting Panasonic for six years. Even with the uh, Micro Four Thirds cameras, I still used uh, some of the L glass from Canon that I'd had uh, in the past. Uh, October, uh, second, October 2nd, 2019, I did a review of this lens, uh, which is an 85 millimeter uh, Sigma lens, basically with an MC21 adapter on the back and uh, so that it fits the L mounts. Um, I also have a Canon F1.2 uh, lens, the 85 millimeter that's been around forever. Very, very well regarded. Um, but to put this in perspective, this lens costs twice as much as this new 85 millimeter. This lens costs three times as much. So twice as much, three times as much, what is this? Is, is this like a kit lens? Is it a piece of junk? Really what I wanna find out in this review is this, is this a legit lens that I would use, that I would buy? Spoiler, the answer is yes. Let's talk about what you get with this lens. Um, the lens is pretty simple and straightforward. Um, there is a hard plastic body, lovely damped uh, focus ring, autofocus manual focus switch that you really have to crank on. It's not gonna slip on you. And a lens hood that locks in and you have to press the button to unlock it to uh, get it off. And it's full all the way around, not a pedal uh, type hood, which is good. I like that. This lens is uh, dust proof, splash proof, and freeze proof. And while I really haven't tested the dust proofness of it, I guarantee you the very first thing I did was take this out in the rain. You can see uh, some of the images here, uh, some of the video here, uh, and you see this duck. We're gonna come back to the duck in a, in a couple of minutes, but 
Um, I think you're gonna be more impressed with the duck when I tell you how I shot that. When I came out of the rain and back into the house, uh, I just wanted to do a quick test and see what this was like uh, in terms of uh, bokeh. And so this image, of course, not particularly important or impressive, other than to give you a sense as to what the bokeh balls might look like with this lens. And I have to say, I thought this was a good start. No one is gonna think an 85 millimeter lens is anything other than a portrait lens. and certainly not something you'd mistake as a landscape lens, but you know the old saying, the best camera is the one you've got with you? Well, as it turns out, while I was out in the rain, one of the things I did see were a couple of landscapey images, but I only had an 85 millimeter lens. But I put my camera in manual mode and I took a bunch of images that I thought I would stitch together. Well, that's exactly what I've done here with Affinity Photo and you can see that works pretty nicely. Now, I'm a photographer first and a videographer second. So I did photography testing mostly. The real story with this lens is the concept of selective focus. Um, which it manages quite easily. In fact, you don't have to do very much with this lens for it to help you tell a story if you've got the aperture open. Let me tell you a funny story. I walked around a corner in a conservation area where I was carrying around this lens and right in front of me, I could see this path that was shrouded with trees on both sides and I thought, wow, this is gonna look great. And I picked up the camera, held it up to my eye and snapped an image. Well, the camera took an image and it was perfectly sharp, but it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. It took a picture of a branch that was right in front of it, which I didn't even see because I was focused down the path. So the camera took a picture of what was right in front of it on the focal point that was right in the middle that had been selected. Um, I tend to use um, the One Area Plus, I think it's called. Um, anyways. Um, so I recomposed the shot and got the shot and that's great. In this example, we can see uh, the aperture is wide open and the depth of field is really thin. And in fact, I would argue that it's too thin to use. Uh, if you open it up, it starts to get a little more usable. But that first shot was really no good at all because the depth of field was so shallow. Depth of field as a concept really is a double-edged sword. It can be very nice to isolate your image so that you can have your subject in focus and have items you know, in front of or behind or both out of focus. Um, but there's some judgment involved in how you do that. So here's a lovely shot of the forest after a snowfall at f1.8 and then again at f22. You can see the flare at f22 in the top left corner and the bottom right corner, but super easy to deal with that just by taking out the saturation in those two spots. But that leads to talking about sun stars. So there's an example. Here are two other examples at f22 shot with this 85 millimeter lens. If we go back to the image of the sun through the trees in the forest, um, I thought that might give a good indication of chromatic aberration because you've got the bright sky and you've got the dark branches that, were, that are being backlit. And boy, was I right. Uh, chromatic aberration, most people think of as purple fringing around high contrast areas in an image, either in front of or behind the subject of, of the image. I would say the purple fringing is almost non-existent uh, with this lens. It does an amazing job of managing it. Uh, the green fringing, on the other hand, is easy enough to find if you're looking for it. You won't see it ordinarily, but if you go looking for it, it's there. I think there are tricks the manufacturers can use around putting coatings on the different lens elements to manage things. Like I said, this is a pre-production unit, but then I thought, well, if I'm seeing the green fringing with this, what would green fringing be like with the other lenses that I have, like the massive Sigma 85, uh, L-mount lens and the Canon uh, f1.2 lens that I have that I have the MC21 adapter on.
And then I thought, well, hey, I've got another, I've got another 85 millimeter lens um, for the Micro Four Thirds. I've got the Noctocron that I use. So I did a test with all four of these lenses. While we're talking about lens characteristics, let's talk about vignetting. When I saw some of the other reviews on YouTube, they kind of said, oh, it's fine, or it was well controlled, and they kind of glossed over it, which I think is a little bit misleading unless the people doing the reviews don't know what vignetting means. Um, this lens exhibits a vignette of at least a stop and a half in uh, its wide open aperture position. Uh, obviously, it lessens as you uh, close down the aperture, but it doesn't lessen maybe as quickly as you might think. So firstly, I did some clinical tests on a plain white background, um, and then uh, I've got an example where you can see this in a real world test. Here we see a plain white card that was lit with a large LED light, and the S1 camera has the 85 millimeter lens on it, and it shot at f1.8. Um, you can clearly see the vignetting here, right? The corners are much darker. If we look up at the luminance, you see it's the white number on the right of the four numbers in the, at the top of the screen, and it's uh, quite a bit brighter in the center. So if we move the vignetting control, we're using Capture One here, up to about a stop and a half, uh, there we show a luminance level of about 147, and over here we've got a luminance level of about 147. Okay, the second image was shot at f2.8, uh, still with the 85 millimeter lens, and you can see that uh, I've tried to even things out, but it's still two-thirds of a stop. At f4, you can see the correction is four-tenths of a stop. If we go to 5.6, we're going to correct for that by bumping up the D vignette about a quarter of a stop. Vignetting is easily managed, certainly in post-production tools, both stills and video, if you feel it's necessary. Um, but I wanted you to be aware it existed, and we'll come back to that when we talk about the value proposition of this lens. Let's talk about shooting people. Here in Ontario, uh, right now, we're in the middle of COVID. There's a state of emergency, uh, so, you know, um, and a stay-at-home order. So getting somebody to shoot with in the studio is, not, is just not going to happen. Uh, I was able to get a friend and his two daughters to come over, and we were able, of course, being an 85 millimeter lens, we would be socially distanced because you wouldn't get that close. And I was setting up in my backyard just before it, we were going to shoot and the snow started coming down like crazy, but then it stopped, which was great. The sun went down and the folks showed up and we were able to take these pictures, showing A, how sharp this lens is, and B, how nice the out of focus uh, bokeh can be uh, with this lens. The other thing is, of course, is shoot. you can't shoot wide open when you get multiple people in a shot. Uh, you'll have some people in focus and some people out of focus. So I stopped down to f4.5 for these three people. But even then, uh, I would say in hindsight, I probably should have gone a little bit further than that. Okay, so let's talk about video um, with this lens and camera combination. Um, when I first got it, like I said, I was out in the rain. Uh, the lights looked fantastic. You can see the duck. So let's talk about the duck. I told you I was going to talk about the duck. This duck is being shot at ISO 16,000. As the duck swims away, the focus lost it. So um, I changed the tracking to uh, human and animal tracking. And then here I am shooting the duck, same duck, different spot, uh, through a bunch of bushes. And this is, it's gotten darker still. So I'm shooting at f1.8, ISO 20,000. And the camera was able to track the duck through the bushes, which you can clearly see me shooting through, down to the beaver dam, which is creating a bit of a waterfall. And then the duck decides, doesn't want to do it and comes back. Um, but the tracking was shocking. So let's talk about bokeh, not in terms of stills, but in terms of video. Um, comparing the 85 millimeter uh, Lumix lens to the Canon F1.2, albeit at F1.8, so they're the same, and the Sigma, the heavier Sigma, uh, also at F1.8. Um, you can see the bokeh balls. I actually like the bokeh balls of the 85 millimeter because they're the most round. 
Um, the downside of the 85 millimeter is that as you move away from the center of the frame, uh, it suffers more of the cat's eye effect than anything else. So where does that leave us? I think that Panasonic has delivered us a small, lightweight, 85 millimeter lens. It's sharp, it's quick, it's splash and dust proof. It works reasonably well for continuous autofocus, really your only choice for the S-series cameras if you're looking for AFC. Um, I think in terms of the aperture, when you open it up, it reveals lovely bokeh. Um, is f1.8 a compromise for you, um, you know, based on the price? Uh, double the price and three times the weight or three times the price? Uh, you know, is f1.8 a problem? Uh, I don't think so. I think this was great. And I love those other two lenses, but at the price, flare is well controlled. I think chromatic aberration, um, the purple fringing is basically non-existent. Uh, the green fringing is there, but you've got to look for it. Uh, similarly, vignetting, definitely there, but is that a problem? Uh, I don't know that it is. So based on the size, the weight, the capability, uh, the ability to selectively focus to tell your stories. Um, you know, you, you take those factors and you multiply it by the price. If you're looking for a portrait lens, I think this is unquestionably good value, but that's my opinion. I'd be interested in yours. As always, if you've got comments or questions um, on this review, drop them down below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Um, yeah, if, uh, if you want to give us a like, that'd be great. And otherwise, I'll see you next time.